Hi folks, we are starting into Unit 2 and today the first lesson here is about forces. This whole unit is going to look at different applications of vectors. So in Unit 1 we kind of studied geometric vectors, arithmetic, uh, algebraic vectors, and what they were. Um, and now we're going to look at different applications of all of those types of vectors and the vector operations that you learned to do in the last unit. So this is a pretty um, physics-based couple days, day one and day two. Uh, but for those of you who have not taken physics or aren't taking physics, um, absolutely no worries. We are going to um, focus a lot more on kind of the theoretical and the math side of this. So it will be very similar to the vector operations that you did in unit one, just um, word problems related to those. So first, just kind of a definition. A force is a push or a pull on an object resulting from its interaction with another object. So forces are anything that can uh, affect one object based on how it's interacting with the other. Um, if that interaction stops, they don't experience the force anymore. Um, if you exert a force on something that's at rest, it will start to move. If you exert um, an additional force on an object that's moving, it would cause it to accelerate or decelerate depending on the direction. So there's two kind of main categories of forces. You do not need to know, um, I'm not gonna ask you definitions or anything about these, but just kind of ideas of types of forces that we might see. So force of friction would be anything, um, a contact force between two objects that um, if you can kind of imagine a real life example, um, if I tilted the desk a little bit, the paper wouldn't move because of friction um, with the paper. If I tilted it too much, then gravity would overtake that. Tension, so that's kind of a pulling force. Um, oftentimes you may see that in uh, things hanging from a wire or hanging from some kind of a, a weight hanging from a wire or a chain suspending something in the air. Um, if you had gas in a container, it's putting force on the wall, like an outward force. So pressure, our feet on the ground are going to exert force. You don't always have to be touching. That's the other kind of um, examples here. So a lot of times I think when we're starting to talk about forces, people picture very physical, like um, there's a pen and I put force on it to move it. It's not necessarily force that's physically in contact with each other. For instance, gravitational force will be acting um, on everything, whether or not it's actually touching the earth. Electric force and magnetic force are other examples of field forces where you can experience that force without direct contact with the other object. The important thing for us, because this is vector applications, is that force is a vector. So force has magnitude and direction. That's really important. If you are asked, um, just like in unit one, if you're asked to find a force, you can't just tell me um, the size of the force. You have to state both the size uh, the, or the magnitude and the direction of the force. You are in charge of knowing that force is a vector and giving me both pieces of the answer for any question that asks about the force. So the standard units for force are measured in Newtons. Um, one Newton is the amount of force required to give one kilogram of mass an acceleration of one meter per second squared. So um, you don't really necessarily need to know um, or be able to imagine exactly what that would be, but just make sure that, you, you know, any word problem you want to include your units, we're going to talk about all forces as um, measured in Newtons, okay? Um, because it's how much force is required to move one kilogram of mass, one meter per second squared, so, or uh, accelerate it one meter per second squared, um, this is mass times acceleration, and that is going to be an important equation for us, in particular talking about the force due to gravity. 
Um, often what we're looking for in questions involving forces is how multiple forces can be combined together. So oftentimes you will be uh, interested in either looking at multiple forces acting on an object and want to find a resultant force or the converse of that you might be given a resultant force and you know how much force is acting on it and you want to break that force apart into um, the forces that maybe are parallel and perpendicular or horizontal and vertical or in two different directions so you will either be typically finding the resultant force, finding the sum of multiple forces, or you'll know something about the resultant force and want to find two or more smaller component forces, probably just two. So this is the resultant. We often give that an R vector, and that's the sum of all of your forces. The component forces, like I said before, are the individual forces that make up the resultant force. Sometimes you may be given the resultant force and say, for instance, the directions or the angles of the component forces and have to find the magnitudes of the component forces. Or I suppose you could be um, given the magnitudes of the component forces and have to find the directions. The equilibrant, that's an important word, it's the force that acts in the opposite direction of the resultant. So I'm just gonna kind of draw this out. Say for instance, we had one force here. So I'm going to call that vector F1 and another force there. If we added those two component forces together, we would get our resultant force, or R. The equilibrant is the force that you would have to have that's the exact opposite of the resultant. So that's the negative of the resultant force to keep that object at rest. So ballpark there a little bit longer. So this green one would be the equilibrant. It's going in the opposite direction. So these guys here are component forces. That's the resultant, and this is the equilibrant going the other way. That's kind of a standard vector diagram for the kinds of forces that we'll be looking at. Um, if your resultant force was going to result in the movement of an object, if you applied the equilibrant force, that would keep the object still. So that's going to be an important thing. Um, for instance, if we have an object that's not moving, then we know that there would have to be an equilibrant force and a resultant force that were in balance. Okay, the last big idea here is looking at that force is mass times acceleration and acceleration is a vector so it wants to have a vector sign. Um, we know the acceleration of gravity on earth. Different planets if you go to the moon you can jump a lot higher because the acceleration due to gravity is lower your force of gravity is going to be lower on the moon because the moon is smaller than the earth. Um, it, so this is a constant value, 9.8. If you've taken physics, you may have more um, decimal places than that that you're used to using, which is totally fine. I'm gonna use 9.8 in my solutions because it's easier for, to memorize and it's not that important. We could always look up um, if we needed a higher degree of accuracy. Um, so we're going to look at how we can calculate the force of gravity. So we have to know the mass of an object and this constant. 
So if we have a 12 kilogram object, what's the force of gravity on that? We just take the mass of the object, multiply it by our 9.8, and that's the Newtons. You have to include the direction, even though that feels obvious. Uh, force is a vector. So you have to write your magnitude and your direction. So you need both pieces of those, um, both of those pieces of information to have a complete answer for a vector quantity. Um, one more definition. I thought it was done definitions. The normal force is a perpendicular force at, on an object that's in contact with another stable object. So if we, if we had, I'm going to draw like probably a terrible picture of a table. And if you have a box on the table, you're going to have a force of gravity acting downwards on that box. Depending how heavy it is, it'll be a different size force. The normal force is the equilibrium. Like that box is not falling through the table because of the force of gravity. So there has to be some other force that's keeping it stable. And that's the force um, acting perpendicular which is going upwards from the table, and that would be my normal force. So those are two forces that might be acting to keep an object stable. Even if it didn't stay stable, um, there would still be that upward force. It's always perpendicular to um, where the two objects are in contact. So the first one is pretty um, abstract. We have two forces of 25 newtons and 40 newtons and they're going to act at an angle of 32 degrees to each other. Now remember forces are vectors. We know the rule for vectors says that if we have an angle that this angle is always tail to tail just like in our vector addition That's important. So I'm going to sketch that out. I have one force there and another force here. And I know the magnitude, careful with my notation here, the magnitude of force one is 25 newtons and the magnitude of force two is 40 newtons. And I want to find the resultant of those forces. I'm adding vectors. So what we have to do is create our, um, I'm just going to label my 32 degrees in there, is to create our triangle or parallelogram just like vector addition from unit one. So I'm going to draw in another F2 up there and try and draw it parallel. And then I'm going to draw in my resultant vector. I'm going to draw it a little bit over so I don't mess up my 32 degrees there and my resultant in there. Now I know that to make this triangle I actually need this angle here which would be 180 minus the 32. So that's going to be 148 degrees. Um, once you've drawn that, a lot of people may be want to redraw a little bit neater without all of the necessarily like the vector stuff in there. So I could put a 25, a 40, 148 degrees, and then I'll just call that the magnitude of the resultant. So kind of taking it from a vector diagram just to like a grade 10 trig diagram. So we're going to use cosine law the magnitude of the resultant squared is 25 squared plus 40 squared 
minus 2 times 25 times 40 times cos of 148. And again, you don't have to show me any steps. I trust you. Um, I do want to see what you're doing. Um, so I need to see this step. Something where you've substituted in some numbers into an equation that I can recognize. And then you don't have to show me like what's this equal to and then take the square root. Just do that all in one step unless you're not comfortable with that. But I end up getting 62.6 .6, and this would be Newtons. Okay. Now, this is only part of the answer. I don't have a vector answer there. That's a magnitude. I need to have a vector answer because it says determine the resultant. It doesn't just say determine the magnitude of the resultant. If it just said magnitude, I'd be done. But I need to keep going and perhaps maybe put a theta in there and find not just the magnitude but also the direction because it is a vector quantity. So I'm going to use sine law with my theta in there and I will have sine theta over 40 equals sine 148 over 62.6. Was there another decimal place there? Yeah, 62.62. So what I'm going to do now, solving for theta, And I get 19.79 degrees. So always two decimal places of accuracy unless it says otherwise. And now I just have to state what the resultant is, kind of combining these together. So therefore, the resultant force is 62.62 newtons. Whoops. And that is at an angle of 19.79 degrees from, from the 25 Newton force towards the 40 Newton force. because we don't actually know the direction of either or any of these forces, but I can just reference it in terms of the forces that I've been given. So whatever f direction the, the 25 is, if I go from the 25 and measure 19.79 degrees, that could go here, but it could also go up here. We could have had that same theta and have the resultant here, but that wouldn't be right. So I have to specify that this theta from the 25 Newton to the resultant is measured from the 25 Newton towards the 40 Newton force. So I'm measuring from force one towards force two. And if I measure that 19 degrees, that's where I find my resultant.